Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, of course, we all know why we're here, and it's to worship the Lord. Uh, but, of course, it is the day of celebrating our love for one another. We also have to remember it needs to be a day that we remember to, uh, to love God, to celebrate our love for God. Um, but a thing that we always don't do is love our neighbor, so I ask, do you love your neighbor today, this morning, in your week, at work, at school, to and from wherever? Do you love your neighbor? And most of us are going to try and say, well, yeah, I think so. But I'm going to read a passage from the Bible. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 10. Now, Reverend Billy Graham, he made a famous sermon and he said, you know how many minutes there are in a day? 1,440. Do you know how many minutes there are in a week? 10,020 minutes. Scientists, out of all we've known, we've never been able to create one single minute. Not even a second. All the inventions we have in this world, we've never been able to invent a minute or a second or a millisecond. And all of this stuff, we think we're so knowledgeable We've never been able to get more time in a day. We've just never been able to squeeze any more time in a day. So we have to make sure that we are loving our neighbor in the 1,440 minutes we have. We don't have time to waste. In uh, uh, Luke 10, verse 25, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now this lawyer isn't a lawyer of the law, per se. He is a lawyer of the Old Testament scripture, of the, of the biblical sense of law. So he works in the temple. So when he asked Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The man already knows. He grew up in the temple, probably, and he was taught everything about the scripture. So he's trying, and it says, he is testing Jesus. Verse 26 says, And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Now this is Jesus responding. Jesus knows this man's a lawyer. He knows this man works in the temple. So he's asking him, Well, how about you tell me what you think is how we, uh, you inherit eternal life? Verse 27, so he said and he answered, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with, the, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Well, then Jesus says in verse 28, well, you've answered rightly. Do this and you'll live. It's so simple that this man tried to trick Jesus, and Jesus didn't even answer the question because he knew that there was something going on with this lawyer that people standing by and his disciples didn't necessarily see. And this all comes out in verse 29, when he, uh, and he, but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? So Jesus is being approached by this lawyer, this man who thinks he knows all about the Scripture, and is trying to trick Jesus, but Jesus knows that there's something wrong about this man. There's something off, and the people around him are not realizing, and it shows. He says, well, who is my neighbor? Well, because he asked it, he's thinking, well, maybe my definition of neighbor is different than your definition of neighbor. Well, it shows right there that the scripture that he thought he was so big and proud, he grew up in the temple, it never hit his heart. It never penetrated his heart. He didn't have compassion for the ones around him. He didn't love his neighbor. To the lawyer, his neighbors were probably the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, the Levites. The, all the people working in the temple were his neighbors. Not Jesus. Not Jesus' disciples. Not the people around him. Not even the people on the side of the street. To him were his neighbors. Verse 30 says... Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem 
to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. We're getting into a parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, this road from Jerusalem to Jericho is famous in biblical times. Uh, it is scary, to say the least. It is a rough terrain. It's on the sides of mountains. There's cliffs. There's trenches. And it's perfect hiding spots for bandits. This road from Jerusalem to Jericho is known for people getting robbed on and beaten and left. So this is a very easy story for this lawyer to relate to. It's very simple, as Jesus says, who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed him, leaving him half dead. There's not really much explaining needed there. But verse 31, Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. The priest passed by on the other side. That's kind of crazy to think about. This man who also is so big and proud, and is no back in the uh, back in their days they wore these big robes with all these different jewelry to show how proud they were and how holier than now they were. And again, it's uh, this priest just passes by a half or a beaten man on the side of the road. The priest didn't have love for his neighbor; he had no compassion. And it's the same as the lawyer that Jesus is talking to. Him knowing all this word, it never penetrated his heart. It never entered his heart. In uh, verse 32, it says, Likewise, a Levite, and when he arrived at that place, came and looked, he passed by on the other side. Now, Levites, guess where they worked? They worked in the temple. They did groundskeeping and led worship. These people knew the word just as the priest did. And still, these two men of God have no love for their neighbor. And many biblical historians say, well, maybe the priest and the Levite didn't touch the, the, the man because they thought, he was, you know, they thought he was dead. And if a priest touched a dead body, they were ceremonially unclean for, for a week and they couldn't do their services. Or maybe the priest and the Levite uh, we're in a hurry to get to the temple because uh, during that time there were so many priests that they only got to work two months out of the year. Well, I can see one big problem with those arguments. This story's made up. Jesus isn't. Jesus is making this story up to prove a point. It has nothing to do with them trying to get to the temple on time so they can get their two months in. It doesn't matter. And remember, we have 1,440 minutes in a day. And if you're not loving the man on the side of the street, how are you supposed to love your, any other neighbor? But look what it says on verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and he saw him, and he had compassion. Now, first, we have to know what a Samaritan is. A Samaritan are these half-breed Jews that live in Samaria, hence the name Samaritans. Uh, hundreds of years before, the northern half of, uh, of Israel was captured by the Assyrians. And those Jews married into families and had wives that weren't Jews. So they created a half-breed. And when the kingdom of Israel came back together, you had half the kingdom with a completely different culture and set of ideas than the ones who were still full, full Jews. And so when they came back to worship in the temple and in Jerusalem, uh, of course, arguments came about. Well, the hatred built and built between the Samaritans and the Israelites and the Jews that the Jews just said, no, get out. We don't want you anymore. And they, and they never allowed them to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. So, the Samaritans made their own temple and worshipped them with their own customs, their own ideas, and every time a Jew would interact with a Samaritan, it was always negative. Something always bad would happen. And to the Jews, and to the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, the priests, the Levites, they weren't worthy of God's presence. They, God had nothing to do with them. But it's crazy to see that a man 
who to them didn't even deserve to be in the temple, had compassion, while the Levite and the priest didn't. Verse 34 says, So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he sent him on his, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. Well, not only did the Samaritan walk by and say, Man, I feel sorry for this guy. I imagine that the man ripped parts of his, of his own clothing off and poured his own wine and oil, his antiseptic, on the, uh, on the wounds and bandaged him up. You know, he, he, he not only felt sorry for the man, he's helping him, he's cleaning his wounds, he's putting him on his own, his own donkey and riding him down the road to an inn. And verse 35 says, And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again I will repay you. Well, we have to know how much a denarii is. Well, one denarii is around a day's wage. And if you convert that in today's money, that's around $32. But the guy gave him two. $64 in today's money. Two days wage. This man paid this innkeeper to take care of this man. Uh, many archaeologists have uh, discovered uh, old Roman inns. And in this one, they found a board that of course had all the prices for how much a stay at an inn was. One day, one night at an inn cost one thirty-second of a denarii. So let's say that the man gave him $64 and to stay one night it was one dollar. The guy could stay for two months. This man was obviously taking well care of him and he said whatever more you spend I'll pay you back. Whatever more you spend I'll pay you back. And it brings us into question, are we loving our neighbor more than we're loving ourselves? You know, James says, James says it's good to love your neighbor as yourself, but you need to love your neighbor more than you love yourself. And this, and this Samaritan, a man who had nothing to do with the temple, did just that. He gave more than what he had to. He could have just paid for the stay at the inn and not had to worry about what extra the man had to pay, or, or he could have just brought him to the inn and let the man fend for himself, but he did more. He loved him. He had compassion. And so Jesus says in verse 36, so which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? It's an easy question. Which one was the neighbor? Verse 37 says, and the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Can you imagine what that lawyer felt when Jesus is telling him that, lawyer, you don't, you don't love your neighbor. We're reading here the priests and the Levites and the, and the lawyers and the Pharisees, Sadducees. They all think they love their neighbor, but to them their, la their neighbor is anyone who works in the temple around them. It's not the man half dead on the side of the street. And even if you do care for them, you make a big show about it, you only give them like two pennies worth. You don't give them more than what you can. You don't love them. And it's crazy to think Jesus says, go and do like the man who isn't allowed to worship in the temple. Now, a lot of people get this story confused and say, well, this is an argument to say that you don't necessarily have to go to church to love your neighbor. And I guess that's, that is true. But now the Bible also says you need to go to church because you have to grow and you have to congregate with your, uh, with your fellow, it's called fellowship with your fellow Christians. Uh, in the uh, passage before this, Jesus also talks about, uh, right before this parable, Jesus talks about how God gives understanding to certain things only if you are a Christian, only if you are faithful, if you have the Spirit. He doesn't give understanding to everyone. Many political figures use this story as a saying that, oh, well, Jesus talks about how we need to give money to the poor. We need to take from the rich this man who had this extra money and just give it to the poor, the man who didn't have anything. And they use it as an example of social justice. Well, I have to tell you that this story is not to bring pity 
on someone with food stamps. And that's not me be da being downgrading. There's nothing wrong with that. But whoever takes that out of this story is missing the point of what Jesus is saying entirely. And I hear you say, well, what if I interpret the story different? This is one of those stories that there is no misinterpretation. There is no need. There, the interpretation is Jesus is saying, we are to love our neighbor, everyone in our path, anyone when we start and we are born in Jerusalem, and we are ending and we're dying in Jericho, everyone we meet on the path in between, we are to love. Everyone in our path, whoever they are. The priest, we're supposed to love the priest that even passed him by, the Levite, even the man that's half dead. Even we're supposed to love the robbers who did it. Anyone. Everyone. If your neighborhood only consisted of 100 neighbors, let's say our world, on, it was just us and, 100, or, and 99 other people. Seven of your neighbors struggle with depression. Fourteen of your neighbors feel crippled by fear or anxiety. Seven abuse drugs or alcohol. Eight are struggling with the loss of a job. Three are grieving the loss of a loved one. And 60 don't profess to be born-again Christians. And you add those numbers up, that's 99. That's every single one of your neighbors. That's every single one of them. And so that statistic there shows that everyone you meet needs to be loved. And who is your neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. Even the robbers, even the priests, the Levites, the man who's half dead. Everyone is your neighbor and everyone needs to be loved. We live in a society today where we can be cut off from the rest of the world. You know, we may be professing Christian and we, when we don't have, we don't struggle with the depression, fear, anxiety, drugs or alcohol. We don't worry about that. But we're in our own home most of the day. We're at work and we don't talk to people to and from. We don't talk to people on the path, on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it's easy to do that in today's society. Why would, we, why would we need to? We have everything we ever need to know on our little computers. And they keep getting smaller and smaller, and we keep getting more and more of them, and more and more social media sites. You know, there's no need to walk outside your house anymore. You don't need to think. You don't need to love anyone else, because if someone needs loving, they'll post it on Facebook. That's how we think. Or the only people that need love are the people in our families, or our close friends, or the people we work with. And we forget about everyone else because they're not in our little clique. I know at school we have cliques of different kids and just our own little friend groups. And we forget about everyone else. Did you know that suicide, according to the CDC, is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States? Number 10. It, it beats overdose. It beats uh, liver cancer. It is right there with Alzheimer's disease. It's right there with heart disease. It's number 10. And it's suicide because these people feel like no one loves them. And the things in their life are putting them overboard that leaves them to the very sad conclusion of suicide. Everyone you meet needs to be loved. We need to love our neighbor. There's no excuse. And the story isn't to bring guilt for us not loving our neighbor, it's to bring guilt for us not loving God enough to love our neighbor. Because God, if he can forgive us and he can love us through whatever we've done against him, because we've done a lot. I know when uh, I sat in my dad's Sunday school and we talked about how many times do we put God as our first priority. Can you count them? Probably not. Because there's not that many. We can't think of them because we never try it. It's always, well... I'll, I'll check my Facebook and then I'll read my Bible. It's never I'll read my Bible and then I'll check Facebook. Think about it. I'll wash my car today and I'll go to Bible study next week. I'll rather just stay at home and do the stuff I need to do around the house. I'll do this and this before I'll read my Bible. I'll do this and this before I pray. The story is to bring guilt and for us not, not loving God enough to love our neighbor. You know, there's more people out there than on, uh, that's in our little cliques, in our little neighborhood, in our little home, with our family and our friends that we talk to every day. There's a lot more people. Jesus shows us this love and this neighborly love. 
And so many people get tricked on it. And it's so easy when you think about it. It's such an easy, easy thing to do is to love your neighbor. And you think about it. But why can't we do it? So I ask you again, do you love your neighbor? Do you love your neighbor the way God wants you to love your neighbor? Do you love all your neighbors? All 99 of your neighbors? Remember there's 100 people in your neighborhood. You're one, the 99 other. They all have something wrong. We all need love. We all need to love each other. And we need to love everyone even if they're not in this room still need love. As Mark brings our invitation today, I ask you all to stand. If there's anyone in here that would like to receive, that, that feels the love of God, the eternal love, 